I do think, and I'll say this now in 2024, that that'll change. I think the human mind, I think the human consciousness is going to shift to a point. And I've seen it in my lifetime that I brought mediumship to the public. I, I really believe that there will come a time where there's, if you want to call it evolution or awareness, that more and more people will realize there's no death, that more and more people realize they're responsible for how they live their lives, that they'll find it when they pass the other side of life. And I think that will change many, many things. Because once you realize you, that never leads you, and you have to relive everything you give the earth, that could scare the heck out of people. <laughs> they want to act the right way. <laughs> Just my hypothesis. But I do think there'll be a change. James Van Prague, welcome back on Just Tap In, brother. What are you most you. excited about right now in your well, life? Well, I'm, I'm getting into the uh, I'm getting into the voting situation in the U.S. right now, the presidential vote, vote and I, I'm doing something which I have to, I feel obligated to do. So I'm sending out to all my my uh, people and my my fan base uh, a note about human rights and just. Uh, voting to keep the democracy so that's what i'm going my, my mind is on that now that's what i'm doing today <laughs> that's what i'm busy doing today i feel it's a responsibility so I, I have to do that i never get political but it's a time in our history here in this country that it's a pivotal time so i'm all about getting that done and then i'm leaving i'm leaving the month of november to go to the desert and i'm not going to have any phones any television, any radio. I'm just going to go with my dog and go hiking and just meditate. So you won't even know the outcome of the of the That's election. That's right, Emilio. Yeah, that is correct. Because either it'll be crazy either way. I just want to be open and just want to just center myself, ground myself, and just get away from the fury and the phonetic energy and all that. Because it's not, you know, just take some time to heal with myself and to. And I rarely do that. I do. I work a lot. You know, I work like you, like you. Because I think as light workers, we come back to work and our light working doesn't stop. I think in all different ways, we, we bring light and love to everyone we meet in uh, every moment of the day. If we are aware to see that God light in every person and to, I, you know, can I just jump in or if you don't mind jumping around? Yesterday, I, I have student calls in my school, my JVP school of mystical arts, and we just uh, are starting a tarot card course, really in depth, spiritual tarot card course. And it's really interesting. The same thing comes up in many of my phone calls with my students and my podcasts. I do that. You know, we're all we're all God, we're all that divinity. And I think part of the, at least for me, uh, part of my teaching needs to remind people that we're all God, we're all that divinity, that divineness, and that we really have a responsibility as light workers to hmm, recognize that God, that light in everyone. And, and treat them accordingly every day. Because I always say every day there's an opportunity. Uh, you have a teacher or a student every single day who comes upon your path. And I think it's up to us to recognize that, to be open to that. But I also think it's important that we recognize that we're all connected as one. And that light, that divine light is the same in everyone. Just our life experiences, lifetime experiences may be different. But they can always teach you and you can teach them. Mm -hmm. You opened up talking about the human rights, which is beautiful. Uh, going a little bit deeper into that, do you feel that the human rights and the soul rights are the same? And what would be those soul rights? No, I think they're a little different because I think that the human, this earth world, this I think the earth is a school for the soul, of course, to take on the human robe, right? Take on the conditions of humanism. And humanism is a very different space than soul. Soul takes on that humanism to have those experiences for whatever, uh, 10 years, uh, just being born maybe, 10 years, 20 years, 80 years, 100 years, to have human experiences in order to grow, to understand the diversity, to understand the various degrees of um, levels of souls. There might be some souls that are baby souls that have never come back here before and don't understand that love is the way it should be and they live in fear and they live in power and with money and if they control people, that's not evolved. And, you know, spirit people said to me once many, many years ago, I might have mentioned this in our first podcast, 
that the earth world, some, an audience member asked me a question and they said, what is the spiritual level that the earth is on? Are we evolved here? And my guys got started snickering and they said, um, the earth world is, is like a, sea, a, a, a grain of sand on the beach. That's how expansive it is. And they said it's one of the most unevolved places because we still have war. We still don't understand that we're killing each other. We, we still have greed and that power thing. And it's very unevolved. And we come back here because it gives us, because we have souls of all different levels of being, with, with baby souls, advanced souls, middle souls, um, it gives us opportunities because of those various the differences in the levels of awareness and evolution of each soul. It forces different scenarios to happen or people behave a certain way. And it really gives us opportunities to learn and to grow and to behave differently or to change people's, uh, open up people's minds to a new way of looking at things. And uh, yeah, that's what I think it is. And so soul rights, I think, you know, we can talk about soul rights, but soul rights to me is just, being able to be who you are, and then and, and, uh, and no one should ever condemn anybody for their soul right as far as if a soul chooses a certain religion, let's say, which is very different than spirituality as far as I'm concerned. But if someone is different as far as a religious belief system, or they come from a different country or have a different skin color, or speak a different language, I think it's, uh, our, we have a right, that soul has a right to live the way they want to live and, and believe they want to believe. And we have to acknowledge that, and we got to... Um, um, really celebrate that and to uh, acknowledge it and to live with that, to bring it in and honor it. I think that's really what's missing in our earth, in this earth world. We don't honor differences. We push them away. And it's so in fear-based because fear is really um, not being able to control others. Fear is someone not the same. That's fear, which is fear is only an element of this human world, this earth world. It's not of the spirit. Spirit is pure love, and we're trying to bring love down to this earth. But earth is very much that separation of the divine. And I think a lot of people come back here, a lot of souls come back here to learn about their, their divine self, loving themselves, self-awareness, loving who they are, not who they're supposed to be, see? And it's such a great illusion here. And if people had an awareness of that, I think things might be a little bit different mm. down here. Yeah, you mentioned about the baby souls, maybe middle school souls, postgraduate souls that would come incarnate here on earth. Do you feel like now with the times that we're living in, may there be more postgraduate souls coming into the planet because of where the planet is at? 100%, 110%. I, I know there are. I know there are. Uh, I do. Although, I, I got to say, and of course, I don't know at all either. And I think things are very hidden. I do. I do think there'll be World War III. I think that's on its verge right now, on a verge of World War III. No doubt about it. I think that this is a schoolroom to learn different things from. And I think history does repeat itself. If we don't get it right the first time, we're going to have to get it right the second time, or we keep on repeating. So look at the war. We keep on repeating. You know, just, and it's so funny because a lot of it's based on religion, which in itself is just, it's, you know, it's not, again, we just honor people's religions, not to control them, not to control, you know, really need to get, let people be who they are and, and, and kind of come to a conclusion or a peaceful conclusion of where people want to live and settle and all that sort of thing. And we should do it fairly. Um, but there's so much of that power, that manpower, that human thing that they get caught up with. And it's a sad thing because when you pass to the spirit world, there is no war. And you'll be in a space where you are really responsible for all the things you've done in this world, all that hate, all that sense of, if, uh, you know, you, you hurt people in wars and you're responsible for that. You're going to have to live with that. And there's, a, there's, a resent there's all that when you pass over. So I think people talk about hell. I think that's where those great people are. You know, those great people, those souls who change the world for the worst and kill people and are responsible for killing people in, in maybe not direct ways, but um, overt ways. I think they end up in a space which is pretty dark and pretty fragmented and not evolved because they're not, that's where they end up. I think they're going to be, you know, hell to me is not fire and brimstone. Hell is living with circumstances that you created when you were in the physical body and that, that you have to live and learn by that. And that's, I, I think that's 
what that is. I, if more people, Emilio, knew that at the end of their lives, that there was a life review and you had to relive everything you've done to another person or every thought you ever had or action you ever had, because all of our thoughts are, are, are really in the auric field and they're different fragments and colors and shapes. And when you pass over, you'll see another person. You don't speak with them physically. You're aware of who they are by the colors in their auric field, by all the, the, the different designs of thought forms they've created. And if someone has a very dark black, let's say, uh, colors around them, you know that they were not a decent character of a person, but also they might not be, they will be up to the same place that you're at. They'll be in a lower, lower sphere, a lower region. And they talk about that a lot, that there are lower regions based on how someone lived their lives, their mindset, and like attracts life. So they will go with other beings on that same mindset. So here we're thrown all together, these are souls, but over there they go into certain regions where they long based upon their level of evolution. What would you be able to speak into about those different regions and spheres on the sure. other side? Sure. Um, well, recently, uh, something very interesting happened. I had a lady that um, my first book is dedicated to, her name is Connie Leaf. And she was really my major influence in life when I was a child. Uh, I was 10 years old when I met her. And she drove up on an old 1967 Impala convertible, which you might not know of. But it was an Impala convertible. I've big, seen them. I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. I've seen them. Okay. And it was, um, she was great. She goes, hey, how are you doing? An outgoing um, effervescent. And she said, I have a young son who's your age. We just moved here from Cleveland, Ohio. Would you like to meet him? I said, okay. And I just liked her immediately. To make a long story short, it ended up that I became more friendly with her than the son. This was okay, but her and I had this connection. And we used to talk about um, philosophical things all the time in her kitchen. And then she, um, eventually she moved to another part of, of New York. And I went out to California to start my career uh, in sitcom writing. And, um, and then through the years, um, I told her about my mediumship work and demonstrations. And she wasn't necessarily a big believer per se, but I did a demonstration for her and her family once. And she was, and that was in October of like when she was about 30 something years ago. And uh, she died in February of that year. That was over 30 years ago. And I really haven't heard much from her, which I, you'd think I would, but I didn't until recently, probably two weeks ago. I heard her say, you need to call Jack, my husband, and Jack, who lives there, they're lovebirds. And, um, and I, him and I have been in contact throughout the years, for sure. But she really impressed me. I called him. I said, I will, I will. So I called and left a message for him, and he left a message for me. We played phone tag. And I talked to him on Friday last year. I mean, of last week. Friday. We talked to him that lovely time. The son is great. He just can't walk a little bit, but he's, he's 91 years old. He says, great. Jack. And then on Saturday, his son wrote me that he passed away. He texted me. I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I was so happy for him because he was with her. And then she started coming to me stronger, which was really interesting. And I think it was kind of a thank you that she's happy I was able to complete that. And then I asked her um, in meditation, I asked her, what are you doing on the other side? She said, well, I visit different places, regions. She called them regions or specters or spheres. You know, I, I think that the vocabulary for those that dimension is so different that we would understand the physical world. So she said, I said, well, what do you do there? And she said, I must, and I've never heard this before. She said, I'm a storyteller. I said, you're a storyteller. She goes, yes, I visit different places and different beings and explain them about the human condition that I lived in and what the humans are about. And I pr present it to them in a story. And she said, and the interesting thing is, you know, you might find it interesting. When I speak about a story, I can present it and materialize it right in front of them. So if I'm talking about a king and, and, a, and a princess, I will project or create a king and a princess to show the story. So she also shows the story as she's creating. She creates it as she's talking about it. Now, the funny thing is, she said, and I was like an awe, I'm like, wow, this is just amazing. Because I know there's so much, of course, over there. We're so limited here compared to the other side of so much that's going on over there. And um, she said, yes, and this, I'm a story, storyteller. On Earth, she was a communications arts major. And she was a teacher, so it makes a lot of sense. And she said, you might find it fascinating, James, that I not only teach where you'd see human beings, but other forms of life. And share with those forms of life what the human experience is about. And about regarding character, um, morality, manners, things of that, so things of that nature, if you will. And I thought that was very fascinating when she said that, because of course I realized there are many different 
levels and forms of life and beings uh, who have never experienced Earth or don't know a lot about humans. So that was fascinating. So that was a uh, that story. So there are many different levels in the spirit world. In the Bible, it says, My father has a house with many mansions. And I believe that to mean uh, that there are many levels, there are many worlds, worlds within worlds within worlds over there. And you go to a world where you are connected with it, you're associated with it, you can relate to. So, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, those evolved beings will go to their world, live with each other, which might not be hacked, right? And then there are those, you know, people that say a certain religion, like Christian people, might go to Christian because uh, it's a reference of what they know of. When my mother passed away, um, she was very Catholic in this lifetime, and she said she met a priest who brought her over. And there are many people who talk about Jesus, seeing Jesus. Is Jesus real? Hmm. Could be. Could be a creation that they've created in their mind or that the spirit world is presenting to them so they feel more comfortable in moving over to the spirit side of life, that they're able to adapt easier. So it tends to happen. Same thing happens when you pass over and you have a desire to, let's say you love um, uh, a cheese omelet, <laughs> love that cheese omelet or a good steak. You're allowed to have that. You can have it over there because you can materialize anything with your thoughts. And because you have the memory of a cheese omelet or a steak or a martini, you can create that and materialize anything you think of. You can materialize it right there. It's like Connie was talking about. And if you drink it or eat it, which you can, it'll taste exactly as it did when we're on the earth. Is it real? No, it is merely a memory. It's a fragment of a memory that you can create and materialize with your mental thought, the form and the shape, and because the memory, the taste of things. So you can create anything over you want. And they create houses over there for people, lovely gardens, lovely gardens of colors we don't have here, lovely buildings over there. And the thing which is very interesting, uh, there's a book by Anthony Borgia called Life in the World Unseen. Excellent book. It was done, I think, in the 30s. And it was done by a, a reverend, a minister, if you will, who uh, passed over. And he realized that what he's been preaching for many years was not accurate. He felt so guilty that he found a medium in England and he went through that medium. I think it was a trans state and described exactly what it was like there. It was very different than his religion. And he felt people need to know the truth. That was what Life from the World and Seen by Anthony Borgia. And a lot of that, my, my truth, Emilio, how he developed my truth is I, I look at all different aspects and all different um, references from different people, if you will. And what I do is um, I look and see, see which one is consistent, which parts are consistent. And with that, Anthony Borgia, it's very consistent with my 40 years of communication with spirit about the different levels that exist and the different regions that exist. You're like cross-referencing with other mediums to, you know, create a puzzle of a story. The last time... And, and, and books that I read and, and yeah, and old documents from, um, you know, England and early American spiritualism. And, and I'm able to pick out, it's very interesting, I, I, and this is true, I mean, of every single, uh, I believe, experience, whether it's when, when you're learning something. So for my students in mediumship, I say, you know, learn as much as you can from many mediums and read as many books, but... I want you personally to pick out what resonates as truth in your heart. So if I say something that doesn't resonate, then don't take it. But if you read something that does feel right to you, no matter what, it's food for your soul. It's something for you that you recognize, that you can digest. And I think that's the way it is. Yeah. Food for the soul. I love that. And food for the soul. The last time we were here, we went into this process about the soul leaving the body, the life review, the adjustment period. But then we also alluded to that there is this sort of like second death where we let That's go right. of our attachments to physical reality That's right. and we go That's on right. to do all our soul's work. So That's right. let's get into now the second part of the death process. Perfect. Okay. So there are some people that come to me and they say, you know, I haven't heard from my mother in so many years or you know, whoever it might be, boyfriend or a partner, child, whatever. And um, I say, well, you know, there are a number of factors involved, but the main factor is that once they become adaptable to the new environment, and again, that can be that they get, it's very interesting that the majority of people that pass over at the beginning tend to go to the mother's house. Now that sounds really weird, but the spirit people have created a house that that soul would remember as a childhood down to the minute detail, like um, a teacup, the teacups, 
the uh, items in the kitchen, the items in the living room, and it looks exactly like their house when they grew up. And they do that because they want them to feel very comfortable with their change. Okay, they feel much more at home, if you will. Um, a lot of people wake up in a hospital setting, not really like our hospitals, open aired, a space where they gain more prana, more life force. Uh, and they can, they wake up that, especially if that's an old disease, if you will, that drain the body of the prana. And um, so there are many different conditions. Um, there are also people that pass over who, um, really experience nothing more than, oh, I feel, I was sitting down in the chair watching television. Next thing I know, I'm here. So we've had that experience as well, but people do it very quick. Depends on a lot of the, the, how they pass over and the conditions of the passing and their belief system. So once you become adapted to the spiritual side of life, that, you know, the physical things, if you will, the, the gardens and the colors and they feel they can have that. Though it comes within the spirit person, the soul, that innate feeling of, um, I, I've lived this. Let, what's next? What's right? I'm ready to move on to something else. It's, it's almost like living out. It's living fully out your sense of desire of appetite, food, drink, physical things. You, so you burn, and I write about this in my books, you burn out that desire. The soul will burn out the desire of those magnetic connections to the human world, to the earth world. Those magnetic connections in the memory are burned out, are released after you've been over there for a long time. Now, it's the same thing, if you will, that if you come back to this, when we come back to the earth as babies, babies and young toddlers have just come from the spirit world. So their mindset is of spirit and they know how to do the spirit. They use their imagination. They're free. They're innocent. They express themselves until the age around know, five, six, seven, when they get so getting programmed by the adults, the teachers, the parents, you gotta behave a certain way. And when they get into this whole thing, about, oh, I gotta be a certain way in order to receive love from that person, because I do think that's what really we're coming down to unconsciously. They might think I need more love and I want to help that person love me and I want to love them. So the, the so that has changed. So think about that when you first pass over, you have the human world in your mindset and, and the mind is the soul, the soul is the mind. So after they've lived out that, um, um, that those feelings, those desires of the lower, of the lower mind, I'm going to call it, of the human part of us, then they're able to, um, they have a desire or, or in a while that they'll meet with their guides, the committees, and they will see, um, what is number one, they might go back to school. I know a lot of spirits that will go back to school to study things they're unable to study here. They might want to play a musical instrument. They're able to do that over there. Maybe they want to be an artist and they get to paint over there. They get to learn that. They go to different schools over there. They can do everything they desire, um, that they have not finished here. Many times young kids, I find not all, but there are some that want to finish university or high school, university. They have those spaces over there that they're able to um, complete their education. It's a, obviously a different type of education, but it's about a certain subject you'd find on earth that they want to study it. Then, like my father, when he passed over, he loved history. He wanted to find out more about history. Now in the spirit world, you can go meet Napoleon. You can go meet George Washington. You can go meet great Joan of Arc. You can go meet great beings, uh, Socrates. Who would you meet? On the other side. Who would I meet on the other side? Um, well, I've already spoke, spoken to some. Um, you know, I've I spoken to Einstein. Um, I, I, I'd want to speak to some, some great composers, I think, some great artists. I think that's what I want to speak to. Um, and that's, 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 and, and that's it. I mean, that's, um, that's, that's it. I, because with me, I just want to, I've always been one that is a natural detective, a natural investigator. Um, let me close my door for one second. Yeah. Mind. yeah. So I, I I don't know with me it's um I always want to learn always um you know I I don't know where in that my, like my friends that tell storytelling I'd like to visit all different life forms I'd love that I love I'd like to go it's fun some funny thing is when I was a kid it's really funny but I've always liked like best people the plants they like well this is one this is one galaxy out of millions of galaxies. Millions of galaxies. They're all different places. And whatever your heart desires to experience, you can have. So, um, many of my friends, many people I know who I've known personally who've passed over, like my mother helps young women who come over. There are beings that go over there who are, um, drug addicts. Let's say they died of an overdose. Many of them will help other beings cross over who also have that condition. 
because they understand, it makes sense because they understand that condition. So it would be better to help someone pass over than those who went through that experience. So there's a lot of that. Uh, I once did a reading for some uh, audience member and a, sol- a man came through and I said, oh, he was a soldier. She goes, yes, because he's saluting and there are those behind him that are saluting. But also he said something to me and he completed suicide, which is interesting. So it was, and, and that's a whole other thing. But um, she, he said to me something very interesting. He said, You're, uh, our brothers and sisters of the earth who are military have made a vow to take care of others. And they continue doing that no matter what. So when someone passes over, there's always a military that helped them over. So that was fascinating. And um, there are those in the spirit world whose job it is, is to bring other souls over, to help them over, to calm them down. Um, you know, I, I think the more someone is aware of spirituality, of the other worlds, that the other worlds exist, that they're not, there's no death, I think it's much, much easier for the, their passing. But if there's someone who's a skeptic, someone who's very cynical, someone who doesn't have any belief system whatsoever, an agnostic, I'm, they'll be pretty surprised when they get over there. It might be a shock to their system, but they'll soon see relatives that they knew and they'll understand that there is no death eventually. And they'll say, wow, it feels like a dream. And let me describe it as a dream. So there are all different jobs and careers over there. And we tend to do that as well in the in-between state of when we fall asleep, our soul goes to the other side and we meet our guides. We go to school. We prepare for, we will prepare for a new physical experience on the earth, have, prepare for whatever that might be. And many times when it does happen on the earth, they feel like, oh, I have deja vu. I feel like I've done this before. It's because in the spirit form, we've been preparing for it. So that, that happens quite a bit too. So all different types of jobs, missions, if you will. Um, I know when I'm, and I'm talking a lot, sorry. I'm very obviously passionate. Um, I know that when I'm teaching a class for a workshop, I, and the students will say often, I had a dream about you last night. And I said, well, that is because we meet in the astral world. We don't just stop here in the physical world. When we sleep at night, we all go to the other side and I continue classes, classes over there. Happens all the time. So there are many places over there where the people are learning. It's all about learning and continued learning. And they take the learning and they also put it into action form. And they, we can say they put it in action form, like my friend talked about the storytelling, but also it could be an, an action form that they choose that, like, um, that, that, let's say a mother passes over and she doesn't feel she did enough for her daughter when she was alive or her father didn't feel he loved, couldn't express his love to his daughter or son. He might or she might become a guide of theirs and try to influence them in positive ways to take care of them and look after them. They weren't able to do it in the physical, but they would do it in the spiritual. So they'll help take care of them, infuse them with different ideas and inspirations and ways of thinking, ways of doing things or of love. Happens quite a bit. Yeah, Yeah, beautiful. You said before that people blocked by the emotion of grief block out the spirit where the spirit can't get through to them. What would you say about healing a grieving heart? Okay. Um, and I wrote a book called Grieving, a Healing a Grieving Heart. I wrote a book with that title. Um, it really is, we always I remember that the soul is a mind, the mind is a soul. And I often say for, for us, the physical human world to comprehend that. Let's say it's an open space. It's all around us a space, let's say. And that can set a space to be a big bubble, right? And, and then our thoughts are reflected in those spaces. Our thoughts that we have are, are created and live in the fields around us. And those thoughts can be different colors and shapes. And the more positive we are, the lighter the colors, the more um, depressed or down is the grays or blacks, darker and, and more dense. And when we think of someone in the spirit place, as someone's passed over, and we're obsessed with, oh my God, they pass, and I'm really in grief, I just can't go on. There is a mindset that blocks, of course, sets up that block in the, in the space. So it's not easy for the spirit people to get through a wall, see? And they've set up that wall, and the stronger it gets with their grief, 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 it builds that space. Now, of course, the spirit knows, and they've been guided by, his, uh, by their guides and told that, and instructed that your human loved one will have a uh, experience called grief and they will miss the physicalness of you. They'll miss the emotional part of you. They'll miss you, mentals, they'll miss that. And they will hold on to that, like a belief system, if you will. And it is hard, very hard then to get through to them. 
sometimes, sometimes at the very beginning, they're open and there are little openings before they build up that construct of the total grief wall. There are um, openings and usually it's early on, like when they first pass over, they go come back to them very quickly. During the funeral service, they can come back very quickly. The memorial service, they can just slip in because that, 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 I don't know how to put this to you. That wall hasn't solidly built yet. This is some fragments. So it's able, they're able to get in easier. I've seen that happen. Uh, and dreams, the number one way the spirits communicate. And they will usually use the dreams right away to get in. Or, and I don't know how they do this, uh, you know, but they do uh, signs. They will, they will transmit by using signs. They transmit by, again, I don't know because it's outside of the human world as far as I'm concerned, but they somehow are able to manipulate the magnetic field and structure of certain objects, if you will, such as a leaf, I mean, a, a feather a flower. Uh, somehow I think there's some connection with the animal kingdom that they're able to assist, be assisted by birds, um, but, you know, butterflies and birds and so forth to help with that. One thing that they do do, I know this, is that the spirit will really work with the mind of their loved one in that they remember the soul is a mind, the mind is a soul. So really when it's uh, mind to mind communication, it's the number, it's that's how they communicate. It's the easiest way. They'll connect you with your, with your uh, mind. So if you're taking a shower, also you think your loved one is because you weren't really thinking about what well, you weren't thinking about them, but they, they're able to drop in because you're not thinking. And that's setting up that construct. They're able to slip in and give you an impression, a feeling of them, an emotion of them. And when we dream, it's because we're, for number one, we're on the other side with them. And the human consciousness takes us, I see them. Um, so there are all different ways that they're able to come through. Uh, my sister is able to use dimes. She comes through with dimes. Now, she had that belief system she, before she left the body. She knew spirit would come through with dimes. So she's using that. And, um, it seems that when things, people can check when there's things that seem to be coincidences or synchronistic or outside the norm, when these things happen, that's spirit's way of coming in. But to be open-minded, to help you know, with, with grief, it's hard because it's a human experience and we have to go through the grief. And I think the amount of grief demonstrates the amount of love someone wants to have with someone. But if they realize there is no such thing as death and that their love has a deed, it adjusts you to the side. And they'll be with them as soon as possible. I think it will help. I do think, and I'll say this now in 2024, that that'll change. I think the human mind, like the human consciousness is going to shift to a point. And I've seen it in my lifetime that I brought mediumship to the public. I, I, I really believe that there will come a time where there's, a, if you want to call it evolution or awareness, that more and more people will realize there's no death, that more and more people will realize they're responsible for how they live their lives, that they'll find it when they pass the other side of life. And I think that will change many, many things because once you realize you, that never leaves you and you have to relive everything you've given the earth, that could scare the heck out of people. <laughs> they want to yeah. act the right way. <laughs> Just my hypothesis. But I do think there'll be a change. Yeah, definitely. And from a spirit world's perspective, what causes or influences a mass exodus of souls to occur? Oh, that's a great planet. question. Very good. Great question, Emilio. I, I, I don't think that there's um, anything that happens arbitrarily. I really don't. At even accidents, what appears as accidents in the human world. Um, now, I mixed up a little bit. This is mixed up a little bit in that. Um, and we've got to just take this into consideration that a soul's free will can get involved. Right, a soul's free will and get involved in someone else's karma. I'm gonna call it that. So let's say and I use example a lot. If someone goes and it's getting dated these days, but if you go to an ATM machine to get some money and someone takes a gun and holds them up and takes their money, that could be their free will, the, the robber's free will affecting that other person, and then they have a karmic connection. So I don't know certain things are karmic, but when waves of souls go through an experience, whether it was World War II, those souls, or souls going through it now, or, or all different types of um, floods or disasters and so forth. I do think that those souls, remember, before we come back on this earth, there's a curriculum that we sign up for. There's a curriculum, there's a game plan, if you will, of all the lessons we're going to be taking. We're hoping we can pass them. And it might be that um, some of those, some, I, World War II, I think a lot of this was because I was very much involved with the Nazi Germany thing and 
being my 50, my relatives passed there. And, and I know I, I'm fascinated with the German things. I, I just am. I, I'm not sure side I was on, but either way, I think there are waves of souls that come in to make change. Waves of souls come in. What are the circumstances? Hopefully it'll create a change on the earth. So hopefully, like this is what you even writes today, this change of, of, of Nazi Germany, you know, the millions and millions and millions of people that were, were, Got, got done, done in, gas or whatever, shot, killed. Um, those, I believe that those souls chose to have that experience from a spiritual point of view. They said, well, and I, and I really believe they were very advanced souls that went through that. I just do. I think the hardest lessons are for the advanced souls. I just do. And by doing that, they will hopefully change the consciousness, the awareness of earth, of human beings, not treating each other that way. And that's been working for the past, what, uh, for 60 years or more, uh, 70. But now it back to the old ways again, and it's settled down, and they're, we're at a crisis now with the U.S., with their, you know, situation could be very similar. And so we've got to be very mindful of, of that, and that's why I'm going to talk about it today in my own <laughs> social media. What would be the higher purpose of a possible World War III? Well, I, I do think there will be World War III. And I think it's, again, we're unevolved here. We're just so unevolved. So there's got to be situations played out that there are, are obviously unevolved beings of souls who are still into the power and the greed and want to control, right? And, and that would be, um, in a way... I, I think good is always going to win over bad, but I think sometimes you've got to go through those dramatic, hard things like war and famine and poverty and so forth to teach people that's not the right way to do it. That's not the right way. You think we'd have learned it by now. You think we'd have learned it by now. But um, I, I just think that's what it is. It's, it's teaching people in those, unfortunately, those adverse ways uh, that, that, that to learn about human, about compassion, about kindness, about forgiveness. It's a hard one. In some ways, we've got to go through the extremes in order for it to be realized and looked at. And, um, you know, just like a hurricane we had in the U.S. recently, you know, it was devastating. People had lost their lives, but the community came together and it showed that when people come together, they can create wonderful things. That's a small scale compared to war. Now, war is the whole of the, of the thing. But I, I do believe that, um, I do believe in some ways it's a mixture of souls that have chosen to go through the waves of souls and that there are waves and there are some souls that are kind of someone else's free will got involved in that. I do believe that. Um, but you know, when you realize there is no such thing as death and, and no one can ever die, there's no death. Um, but you know, again, it's all different levels of souls and awareness. I mean, even the young man that said, I met by the military. You know, for him, that's his reality. That's his world. And for the people that are saved, that are rescuing or bringing him over in the military, that's their world. For me personally, I don't believe in that. I know I lived in wars, went through wars. I heard uh, about two months ago, I heard, you know, you've always chosen to come back during wartime. And I'm like, huh? It's like, wow. And that makes sense to me because I know I was a general in many wars. But now even the thought of a gun, I freak out. I can't look at a gun. Any violence I have a hard time with. So I've learned that one. I've learned that one, that war is not the one, well, not the right answer. So new soul is different. Sure. And again, these things I say to you are, is only a small piece of it because I won't know the rest of I pass over the 75%. I can give you a little, little bit of it, but more of it's the awareness on the other side of, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, Things um, a three, in the three-dimensional world, properties of a seventh dimension don't necessarily work, and laws of a seventh dimension don't necessarily work for a three-dimensional world. So we only get little tidbits of things. A little glimpse of the, the whole puzzle. <laughs> but one thing we should always be aware of is that the strongest d d uh, force uh, that lives throughout is that love. Love is the force that really uh, lives lives throughout. You know? And I do think there are no accidents. I do think there are... Um, coincidences, if you will. Um, I just, I, I just do. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's that. Why do you feel that? This... I want to show you something, if you don't mind. Oh yeah, for sure. I was, you know, yesterday when we're talking about coincidence, 
I think things happen every day if we're open, if we're open-minded, that there's that space once again, the moment of grieving, but in life, if you live a life where you're open-minded and you're not predisposed, you know, you know so much in control, oh, it gotta happen this way, it gotta happen. And that's ridiculous, it's a waste of energy because no one's ever in control, really. We're, we're never in control. We, could, we can't control other people, we can't control situations. We just can control how we respond to things. So anyway, I'm open-minded every day to an experience and a state spirit. Use me any way you want today. Show me things I need to know. And yesterday I'm driving around and um, I went to my um, a, a, a workout, my gym workout, and it was a little early. So before I did that, I went to a uh, business park across the street. I'm like, huh? And it says Spiritual Institute of Metaphysics. And I'm like, that's very weird. I've lived here 10 years and I've never seen it. And they were showing me things there. Um, they had, like, let's say posters. And this was one I thought, wow, I relate to this. Hmm. You see that? Maybe zoom out a little bit, bring it a little bit closer to your face. Oh, wow. Yeah, what is that? So that is a graphic from the Spiritual Institute of Metaphysics. And, and it's just, um, it's just beautiful, really. Um, and it's a place where, God, I'd love to share this if I could, but I'm not sure how. <laughs> Anyway, they talk about the divinity of human beings and it's everything that you and I would know. Of. You just, it just say, wow, it's, it's the divinity is finding that love, the spiritual laws that exist of cause and effect, um, and all different types of spiritual laws that we should live by. Right? Yeah, I agree. How is the God's divine will different from humans' free will? Oh, good question. I, I, I think, again, we got to be very, very careful because we're looking at another level of, of beingness, right? So we only have the human to, you know, to really reference, uh, the human reference, so we have to do it in human terms, really, which just goes beyond the human. So um, I don't necessarily put free will in God, you know, the divine. I think things are just the way they are. I think the human tries to control that and tries to um, have that. I think that in our life, uh, before we come back and set up our lessons, that there are opportunities and lessons for our own souls. It's always souls growth, right? So there'll be opportunities where we have a choice between this can happen or this can happen. There's free will. You can, you're meant to meet this girl at a cafe for coffee. You're, you're destined. There are destiny points. So there are certain destiny points that are meant to be. So there's destined that you two meet each other at a coffee shop. It's your free will if you'll continue seeing each other or it's just a coffee, that's your free will. So I, I think that we gotta be aware of uh, that. I think it's easier to make the right choices, free will choices, uh, the right ones, if you live in love, if you live in that, if you have the awareness of love, the awareness of treating another person like God, like the divine they are. And I believe in the golden rule and I live by that. You teach others, you wanna treat others as you wanna be treated because we're all connected. I, I told this you last time, I'll say, say it again, is that two of the greatest solutions we have in this three-dimensional world, one is death, there is no such thing, you can't kill energy, and the other is a separativeness, which is separate from one another. When a reality, when you pass out of this dimension, it goes, oh, wow, we're all connected. We're all part of that big, you know, uh, kaleidoscope, if you will, or a snowflake. We're just different fragments of the snowflake, but it's all one. And I think that's really what it's about. It's unfortunate in the human school, this earth school, that there's a sense of being separate when really it, it isn't. And then the human, the human gets in the way and human creates, you know, wants control. The human wants um, power and they'll do whatever they can to get that. And that's destructive. It's corrosive to our soul's growth in many ways, most of us. And uh, it's wrong. And uh, because they're coming from a fear base. Awareness is that a love-based awareness because fear is only of the earth and fear is false ego appearing real. And we get a lot of the trouble. And I, I know it's from students I teach with and so forth. When they talk about mediumship and becoming a medium, they get, what if I get possessed? It's like, you can't, you can't get, I, I don't believe you can get possessed because you're pure love and light. And if you're connected with that loving energy, the divine energy, that vibration of anything lower than that can't be around you. It'll dissipate. So it was a very love, 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 love. Mm. And back to the destiny points for a moment. I've heard you say that it's easier to make the right choice in our lives 
and be aligned with our destiny points, the more we know ourselves. So there goes a how-to question. How do we get right. to know more of so, ourselves? So, right, so I'm just saying that, and it's a really good how-to. How-to. Well, number one, accept yourself for who you are. Stop trying to be someone else. Try, stop trying to please people because it'll never happen. And, and you know, um, whatever people, what I, and I live by this, and I teach people this, and maybe you've heard other people used it before, other teachers. Um, what other people think of you is none of your business. And that's true of family and friends. So you got to stop trying to please family members mm-hmm. and friends and try to, and, and you know, when you try to do that, you give away your power. You give away your spiritual power. You're giving your essence away. It's not who you are. You are you. And the more you're you, the more you teach others. So once one knows themselves and when knowing themselves is trusting themselves, it's taking chances. It's jumping in. Yeah, you know what? It might not work the way I'm thinking, but it'll work out. Have that faith. It's faith. It's hope. It's charity, it's love. It's all of that and knowing what that is and honoring yourself as a spiritual being having a human experience. And once you have that re- relationship that you are a soul having a human experience and living life in a soulful life and attempting to live a life for the soulful or spiritual laws, being mindful and cognizant of spiritual laws such as cause and effect, very, very important one, uh, then you start and uh, start changing your mindset. It'll start, it'll start seeping into your consciousness, your mind, your mind, and you'll begin to act accordingly. You'll begin to start living accordingly. And number one, you know, there are all different ways you can do it, but I always say get from the head to the heart, go to the heart, the heart of the matter, I say, and look at everything from and live life heart forward, not in your head, in your heart. And the head can follow the heart, but you know, when we pass out of the body, it's our heart that survives, not the brain. The mind, the brain is gone. But the heart, that loving heart, that essence of who you are as a being with that heart space, that love. You know, the organ ties out of the heart, but the essence of who you are is tucked neatly here within our heart, that soul, that essence. So the more we can get into that space and have a relationship with your heart and, and not looking to others for validation, that's a very good beginning. And be who you are. Like you, you're a great you're a great example of someone who, who you are who you are. You do what you do. You get out your word to help people. You don't care if someone believes it or not. You're just doing your thing. And that's it. And treating others you want to treat it. That's a great example. Of, and it can be done because you and I do it. We, a lot of us all, a lot of us do it. And uh, and that's part of our reason to come back and teaching others that they, they can do it too. All of my students, I was saying this last night to a, a, a person in my school, who helps me in my school. And I said, you know, every course we do in my school, it all comes down to no matter what question it might be, no matter what course it might be, whether it's a 28 day transformation, whether it's psychic um, um, expansion, whether it's mediumship, it all comes down to self-love, self-awareness, having that sense of loving self. Because once you truly love yourself and you have your power, you can do anything. You know, God says, yes, we humans say no. We limit God. God says, yes. Anything is possible. Just like when we were little kids, our imaginations were king, <laughs> king and queen. We were able to, you know, have whatever we want or imagine everything we want. And that's the way it should be. We should just kind of live that way. You know, that's how I feel. Beautiful. Last time you mentioned that you dislike power with ignorance. So I wanted to ask you, what does power look like without ignorance? Well, I, I, I think when someone's in a powerful position, a power position w- without ignorance and without ego, see, it's a big thing without ego. That's a big part of it. If someone's in a very powerful position, as I am and you are in, in a way, because we are influencing other people. To me, it's influencing others. And, and, and the more people you influence, the greater the power, the greater the responsibility, right? So powerful people without the ignorance come to responsibility and awareness. And um, I, I think Kamala Harris has that. I think she talks about that. It's being responsible for how you treat another human being. It's being responsible for the words that you give out. It's being responsible for how you're being um, uh, a- empathetic to others and using that power position to make lives of people better, whether it's in corporations, whether world leaders, whether heads of associations or clubs, 
It's helping people to help themselves. It's giving them that opportunity to realize who they are and that you can assist them in many ways to be themselves and to honor themselves. That's what that is and, and, and reach for possibilities. And I think that also in that power position with that ignorance is to show others that they too can reach new heights if they truly believed in themselves. And if it's a power like, for instance, a great example is um, um, the guy that runs Tesla. What's his name? Elon Musk. Elon, yeah. So Elon Musk has power with ignorance. He's completely ignorant about it. So he has a great power. Power comes responsibility, money, big responsibility, because it's the energy is how you use that energy with money. So he's not using it per se. He's just using it for himself and his own ego, right? Not to make the world a better place, but to create his own fantasies of cars and ship, spaceships. And all that. I don't think that's, I, you know, it might become the guise of, oh, we're evolving. Mm, I don't get that. I don't feel that with this person. And Trump, the same thing. I don't feel that with him. I think he's just self-involved and is an authoritative. He wants to be a dictator and really doesn't care about people. He just wants to get in, into the White House or go to jail. That's what I believe. And, and that's, that's power with ignorance, complete ignorance and mental illness, really. And I think that's really a shame. I think that, but we have to learn from that, right? We have to learn that this is not the right thing to do. It's not the right thing to do. It's not morally right. There's no morality there. It, it, it's again, making, I wish we had the people in our uh, positions like that to create the better world and, and thinking of more people, all, all of us, instead of one, you know, it's very interesting politicians, like I said, and, and some Fortune 500 people, I've seen in corporations, it's very interesting that the energy, it's all energy, and there's certain energy, of course, running your energy through the chakra system, if you will call it that, if you want to call it that, bring that energy up, um, we learn to bring the energy up to the highest of levels, you know, the higher we are, the more we're in touch with the divine. The lower we are, the more in touch with the physical. And I find that the energy from the third, one, two, three, fourth chakra, with the solar plexus, it's the power chakra. And a lot of that, a lot of powerful people, ignorant powerful people, have the power in that solar plexus area, and it stays stuck in that ego and power and used that way. A lot of politicians, a lot of people have it. Instead of bringing that power to the higher levels. So we could say that power could have been, um, I'm going to say, and I'm not a religious person, but I will say there have been past popes who I felt like John Paul, I think, had that sense of empathy, brought that power up to the heart space. And there was an empathy, there was a conscience. Even though there was a belief system, a dogmatic system, he also, you could recognize that he had a compassion, he had empathy. So the energy was brought up. The same with Shasta Teresa, uh, you know, same with Gandhi, um, some great, great minds like Einstein, very powerful, right? But yet use that to a higher level to inspire great philosophers are like that. Then he's up to a higher level. So great artists, you see. And, uh, that's, that's really what it's a difference, you see. It's using that world, that, that energy for the higher goodness of humans and, and of the species, but for humans. It's those in the higher level do that. You can see the difference. Because those are, some people call them evolved, but it's bringing that energy to a higher level of awareness, uh, empathy, kindness, understanding, patience. That's the higher levels. Mm. That's the ones that are not ignorant. Yeah, beautiful. I, I wanted to ask you there, why do you feel that these upcoming U U.S. elections are like nothing we've ever seen before? Well, I think it's a tipping point. I think that people have been really, um, uh, you know, World War II started with fear and the escape of goats with the Jews because, of, oh, the banks run by Jews made that whole, this whole thing blaming. Fear based, fear based. I think there's been so much fear in, imbued into this country, uh, through Trump and through his colleagues and just, and fake news and all that misinformation stuff. It's like, what's going on here? That we forgot the humanness. We've got how we can hold to each other and love each other instead of spouting out fear and craziness. And that, and I, I, again, I go back to it's learning. It's learning. It's understanding that this won't work. This is not the right way. It's, it's love is the only way to do it, not fear. So I think as humans, we haven't learned that yet. Generally speaking, humans haven't learned that yet, that that's the wrong way to be. That they have to have a world full of love and kindness and compassion. And if we continue down the path of ego and power and 
you know, darkness and fear, it'll create a World War III. And who knows what's going to happen at that point? Who knows? There might be waves of souls that leave and might, the planet might be blown up or part of it blown up. And then perhaps then we'll learn, oh, that wasn't the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, you know, you think we'd learn it by Hiroshima, World War II, and you think we'd learn those things. But it's just, uh, it's, it's sad. It's a sad place. Um, and I think information is getting in the way. I think so, so social information, internet uh, is getting in the way. I think, you know, the fastest society technology, it's going so fast that it's not stopping. Again, I think it's breed-based, to tell you the truth. I think it's breed-based. Let's be the fastest one. Let's get the new inventions. So they forget about the divinity. They forget about the human creative part. So Greg Braden, who's a good friend of mine, spoke about this on my podcast about, you know, the more we technologically advance with AI, which is, I think, one of the dangerous things ever, um, because you promote falseness, you promote that uh, illusion, that truth. I think when we do that and we start playing God, right? We start playing God. And I do believe Elon Musk wants to create, put chips in people and create, which is unbelievable because we start playing God. And we start creating robots and mechanical stuff and God, really just really to serve the ego of the person, that the Elon, if so, whoever has to do the AI thing, um, that we lose that sense of uh, divinity, that creative spark, that individuality that we all have, that makes us unique, that makes us a unique snowflake. And that's the problem, because if we lose that creativity of the divine, we really lose our sense of who we are down here. And uh, Greg was saying so it's a war between good and evil. You know, I used to say, we're not, but it is. It's, it's good and evil. It's, it's dark and light. And I think, like I said earlier, are there more light workers? I think definitely there are more light workers. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised um, if other beings and other life forms from other, uh, other galaxies go come in and, and intercede. Because the you, I've heard this somewhere. I've, I've read it and heard about it. I don't know if I believe it, but I'll just present it. Is that you know, if the Earth does something to itself, it'll throw off the entire cell, satellite, the whole system, the, the whole system we're living in, the solar system we're living in, and other solar systems. So I don't think they would allow that. There's, there's a certain order that would be allowed, and would be, you know, UFOs or what you want to call them now, or other early forms would get in, intercede. And I would hope that be true. I would hope that'd be true. That they're stopping to say humans and then grow up. Come on, let's do a different way. But we'll we'll see what happens. But all we can do for now is to bring love and shareness and, and open people's minds and hearts to truth about light and love and understanding and empathy and kindness. We need to spread kindness. Hmm. What do you feel it would take for humanity to be ready to have that open contact? with extraterrestrial beings and being able to see more ufos and here and there well number one would have to take the governments to accept it and share because this is not threatening it's just the opposite of threatening but you know that i think they've been around forever and um i mean i've seen them myself many times I've seen when i was developing my mediumship light beings other beings some call them, um you know uh, aliens would come into the development circle and there was a friend, it was the opposite. I felt the most incredible love. I was once uh, in Sedona, Arizona, and I was um, with a group of people there to go see UFOs because they love the copper mine, copper fields, and below the earth, they like the, the copper foot, they need that. Anyway, so um, after we meditated, it took us to meditate to raise our vibration. And, and because I'm not sure I told you this last time, but it's a good one. Um, and I remember that we, we raised our vibration by meditating. And I remember then we started seeing colors in the sky, lights, uh, objects, and they look kind of like TV antennas at a studio. That's sort of the closest thing I can tell you they look like. And uh, the gentleman that was working with the group said, you know, if you want, uh, they're here. And I said, I, I know. And he goes, can you get communication? And I did. I walked out to a field and I completely opened myself up. And I, I, I said, welcome. And they came into my mind. And I felt immediately that they were dumbing themselves down. That they had to really go to slow vibration in order to come to go with the human. It's so dense. They had to really go down. And they said, we do not, we are from the Pleiades and we do not understand one thing. You human beings have the energy of love all around you, yet you don't use it. Why is that? And it's really true. So I think that we need to have a, a relationship with ourselves, of loving ourselves, feeling more worthy than having that relationship you know, evolve and, and feeling connected to everybody else. 
and, and, and being open to this fact that we're just not the only ones that survive, that there, we have to open up our, our perceptions, that we are indeed part of a vast, 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 vast world within worlds of the worlds. And there are many life forms. And that is all done in love, not, not fear, it's love. Again, fear is only the human world, the human vibration. It's not any other dimension. And, and so I think we need to raise ourselves up to that level of awareness and love in order to be interactive, uh, aware of those beings. Another thing that happened, I love to talk, don't I? Another thing that happened, Emilio, I was, I love having, it. A, okay, I was having a party. At, uh, someone threw me a party for my had a TV show back in the 2000s, TV show, a talk show. And they um, threw me a big party in a Hollywood club. And it was the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and La Brea Avenue. Big club there. And we, they took it over for like two or three hours and it rent, rented it out to like 200 people. And there was an indoor area to dance and there was an indoor patio. So at one point we're all in the patio and I had two of the friends there. One friend um, that uh, was a healer who was in the corner I was talking to someone else. And another friend who was a medium, also a healer in the other side of the room, in the outside patio. And I was in the other corner. And all of a sudden I look up, just looked up and I see a ship. I see a big, big ship, and it was I was underneath the ship, and it was all these lights underneath it and panels, and I'm like, ah. and immediately the two other people, I we all locked eyes with each other, and we all like the three of us. Nobody else saw them. <laughs> Nobody else in that patio were aware of that big ship right there. And so, how much of that are around us all the time? And looking in on us and around us, just like the spirit people, that there is such a high frequency or vibration that we don't see them. And I just think in that scenario, the makeup of who we are as healers and the vibration that we're at as far as raising our frequencies, we're able to get that. And then, of course, we're lowering theirs to a certain level. And they obviously were, were beaming down, if we use that term, to our minds for those who could receive them to look up and you know, obviously realize they're there. And I mean, it was huge, carried the whole whole top of the building. And it was like, wow. You know, if you, if it was like, it was like a movie, you know, it was like a movie uh, that if people saw the thing, oh, this is not right. But it was there, it was there. That's gonna be the next TV show. Just <laughs> <laughs> remaking that experience to get it, yeah, you know, into the mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> to switch gears for a moment, I've heard you say that the sound of a person's voice allows you to pick up who's around them. Yeah. What is the role of our voices frequency in connection with the spirit world? Very good question. So if everything is energy and everything is sound and everything is sound, waves of sound and, um, and light, right? There's a certain frequency or vibration that a sound gives off, a voice will give off a certain vibration. And it's that vibration that I have to tune into. And because the spirit person is so close to that individual, that but they're closer because their job when they come to communicate is to slow down their frequency to match the vibration of the loved one. Right. And 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 I'm um and you know, and they're pretty much I'm pretty how can I put this ex expansive in that I can change frequencies. So it's, it's more or less, they come, it's them getting closer to that vibration, that sound vibration of their, of the recipient, the person they want to be with, to connect with. And it's because I have to hear that voice, that that voice stimulates, if you will, that, that frequency that stimulates that, the vibration, and, and I can hear it, and I want, then I'm shot right away into their level of vibration. So I want to describe it, I guess. I'm shot right into the vibration of that person, and it's easier than to pick up on their frequency, who's there attempting to get through the frequency. It doesn't have to be that way with mediumship, by the way. Not every time do I need to hear the voice. It helps with hearing the voice because it kind of grounds it more. I guess that's how I could describe it to you. But I also can tune in to someone without using a photograph. Because listen, mediumship is not easy. It's hard, mediumship, because you really have to work at raising your frequency and, and keep sustaining that vibration. And, you know, it's, it's, it's energy, so it's fluctuating all the time. And just like sound fluctuates, you know, the vibrations. So the medium's got to be really the point where they're able to be patient, if you will, when rest and wait 
be, but really be on that higher frequency, sustaining that frequency, but really being aware of that energy is coming up and down of the spirit. And, and, and there, are, you know, any communication, it's like any sound or um, peaks and valleys, right? So there are peaks and then there are valleys. And the peaks, when you really hear something really strongly, but then all of a sudden they have to, the energy goes down there and they, and you have to wait a little bit. And that's the hard part with medium, be developing mediums. They don't know about the pauses. They don't know about those valleys. Now those valleys are very important because number one, it gives the spirit a moment to readjust their vibration. It gives a medium time to take a break, break in their mind to, re, to rest, to receive the next vibration. But if you have a medium, who's, oh God, I got to get an evidence. You got to get these evidence. Then they're in the human head thinking about it. They're not doing mediumship because they're thinking. Mediumship is when you're not thinking about something. And it is an open vessel. It's the best type of medium there is. An open vessel medium. Not someone who tries hard. You try hard, you're bound for not succeeding. And it's not about you. It's about the spirit person. You're just the vessel. So if you're thinking about it, then it becomes about you and you'll get nothing. And that's a hard one, you know, with humans, uh, as well as developing students, because they want to be in control or they're so used to living their lives in control, right? And this is a point where you have to soften them and surrender. That's hard for a lot of people to do is just surrender themselves. Is there anything that you've picked up about me through hearing my voice in this conversation? No, and the reason why is I'm not working right now. I mean, if I was, because for me, I, I honor the communication work I do, and it's not something like you can just like jump and jump jump through the hoop. It's it's really preparing my mind to raise the vibration of frequency to be aware of it. It's it's really a sense of being respectful to the spirit world and to the process of it. Um, and, and that's, I, that's why I'm, I'm not doing that. If I was preparing for that and doing readings, I would, I would probably pick up something very easily from you. Now, it doesn't say that, I mean, you just can't jump and do that. I've chosen over my many years not to, because for me, it's about a matter of the process. It's a respect, it's a process. It's also the people that come and say, you know, these are students of mine will say, you know, I just get these spirits all the time to bombard me. I just can't stop. I said, well, then you're not in control of your vessel. You're not in control of the instrument. And part of developing as a medium is really learning how to be the proper instrument and using it correctly. But unfortunately, we have TV shows like Teresa Caputo's show, Lionel Medium, and Tyler Henry's show, he's on TV. And, you know, the nice people, I guess, and I met one of them, they seem nice, and for their mission is genuine. But unfortunately, they haven't been taught the correct um, mechanics of mediumship. And, and, and it was a really bad thing to do I, because I'm a teacher and I'm so, hold this so, I'm so passionate about mediumship and teaching the correct way. Is that when we demonstrated this truth with Pluto was on our media, they just show going to a butcher shop and oh, I get this one. And, oh, I get that. And I get that. Not that they can't, but if a medium is not working properly and they're always open like that, um, it's, it's very, it's very harmful. It's very much like a, a ceiling fan that the motor is always turned on. And eventually they'll burn out. And that's the same with our adrenal system, our endocrine system. We have very fine, sensitive systems in, our, in the human body that work in, uh, in tandem with organs and, and, and really in, in fact, psychic faculties. And if they're overwrought and they're overused and abused, they'll start breaking down. And then um, things start happening to the physical body. Because think of it, we're all spiritual beings, mental beings, physical beings, emotional beings. While spirit beings, if you start working on the spiritual side and you break down the physical when you do the spirit, it all starts crumbling. And I've seen many, many people that have passed away of diseases that were, I believe, caused by improper use of the adrenal system or endocrine system. That's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful segue into how do you avoid getting into a lower frequency and burning out your adrenal system? Oh, that's because I, I, I believe everything is moderation. So when I first started doing mediumship 40 years ago, I was very excited about it. And excitement is okay. And passion is okay. But just like in any job in life, everything needs to be in balance. Everything needs to be in moderation. You can't do one thing. You've got to just do balance. Otherwise, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect your health. And uh, that's really, really important. Even somebody drinks all the time or 
you know, uh, it, it, or does drugs or, or is in a bad relationship, a codependent relationship with someone over and over again, they bring someone bad, it's going to affect them. Um, everything's about to be in moderation. So I, it's, and it's hard at the beginning. Uh, I've learned and evolved over time, um, the energy I want around me. Uh, and it goes back again to sense of self, to having that, that sense of yourself, find that joy within yourself, that love within yourself, that faith, that excitement. I've always had a life of excitement. I think I came in that way. I came in with a sense of awareness of who I was. I, I, I always did. I mean, as a kid, I could see spirit, new colors around people. I saw them. Not everybody could do that, but that's who I am. And that's who I was. And I've always been able to laugh at myself, which is a gift. Um, I've always found the joy in things. I, even in a pessimistic world many times, or, and I'm a human, you know, part of the human condition is going through the ups and downs. That's part of it. So we all can't be saints down here because we're going to have some things that really piss us off sometimes. That's okay because we're human. It's part of the human experience. But in overall, just a sense of self and a sense of, you know, balance, it, to me, is a key in, in everything in life. I've lived that way, uh, and uh, I, I think it helps quite a bit. Hmm. James, and the last time we chatted, when I asked you what you were excited about, you said that you're excited about that light bulb moment with your students when you're teaching. And I wanted to ask you, when was the last time you had that light bulb moment go off in your head about something that you were pondering over in your life? Well, um, well a couple of times. Yesterday I had it when I, I'm, I'm doing a tarot card course right now. It's just uh, being... Um, our starter right now. People can buy it right now, right? My JP School Mystical Arts, they can buy it. And we've been doing like these free webinars and, and seminars on online and, and reading the cards, which I, I'm not an expert tarot card reader, but my associate who's working with me, Liz, is. And she's taught me all these like little ways of looking at the cards. And she's teaching students about this, that the different symbols. And they're like, oh, that's so incredible. These little symbols are on those cards and that'll open up your intuition. So it's reading those cards intuitively. And that is a great one. That was like, wow, I never thought about that before. Oh my gosh, that's great. And then um, the other thing was, and it's just my own thing, was for years I was, um, you know, thinking about uh, what book should I write next? And I was doing a tour in New Jersey two weeks ago and I went to a bookstore and the man behind the counter said, hi, James, how are you? And I'm like, hi, do I know you? He goes, yes, you signed here twice. And oh, that's why they have signed here. He goes, people keep on asking me about your books. You get a kind of book. And I think, well, yeah, you're the third person that's kind of asked me and I need to think of a book to do. And nothing has really hit me in that I need to, that I want to. Because for me, in order to create something, no matter if it's a TV show or a book or a piece of art or a garden, it's got to mean something for my heart, right? It's got to come from genuineness and heart, heartfelt. So um, I'm coming up with the next book. I'm starting a new book in January, and it's going to be my autobiography. Oh. <laughs> so, what's that a, was like, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> what's one story? You know, you don't have to give us the whole autobiography. But well, I, haven't, I really story? haven't started thinking about it. It's got, you know, I guess the cover of it, which is very <laughs> interesting. I'm going to incorporate um, many of the readings of it for celebrities. So they're very interesting and, and really get that sense of that um, celebrity is a celebrity here, but not in the spirit world. So, for instance, Audrey Meadows came to me. Well, she was a good fr friend of mine. I was a client of mine and I helped her pass over, which was really interesting how that worked out. And she said, I'll be there for you. And she came to you last year. I was, I was very ill with uh, COVID, really ill. And I'm lying and thinking, okay, take me away. And she showed up right behind me and she said, James, it's not your time. And Audrey Meadows won a show called The Honeymooners. So she was a, in case you don't know, Amelia, it was a very famous sitcom in the 50s and early 60s. And she was a client and she said, it's not your time now. I'm like, okay. And I said, so, oh, what do you do? What are you doing? And she said, she goes, well, you know, if I'm not that character on television. None of us are. We're our true essence when we pass over. And she goes, I took that character on for comedy, for some time, in order to heal people through comedy, which I think many healers, um, our com comedians are healers. I really, really do. Um, so, yeah, that that was a, a pretty wild. Well, I'm talking about that experience. I'm going to talk about... Um, just weird synchronistic experiences in my life, how I got started with mediumship in a very weird, strange way that I wanted to be a sitcom writer. And I drove to California. I was promised a job from a big producer. And I got to California and he, he lied to me or he didn't tell me the full truth. And um, But if he hadn't, I might not be doing what I'm doing. So it's 
in that way, that weird, strange way that things happen. And I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that, how things happen in such a uh, strange, uh, strange, odd way, but it really all makes sense in the end. It, it's kind of like we have the, the spirit world has their own way of helping us go around and around and in and out, but it means something. Everything means something. So I want to talk about that in the book too. Everything really means something. We're not understand at the moment, but it means something later on. And I'll get many examples of that. So. Beautiful. Well, you know how much I respect you, and I'm definitely going to be <laughs> reading your autobiography. So that's going to be Amelia. such Thank a beautiful you. thing. We end every show as we did last time with a segment called The Final Trio. Um, but before that, you mentioned some upcoming projects. Where else can people connect with you and anything you you have going on in your world? Sure. The, the tarot card course is a really great one right now. Medium 2 is happening. So it's the jvpschoolofmysticalarts.com. That's the best way to get in touch with me. The jvpschoolofmysticalarts.com. And then I have a website, which is vanprog.com. And I will be doing some readings soon. Um, do small seances for 10 people. Just 10 people. And um, it's my way of practicing, keeping it going, you know, sharpening the pencil and also helping people. So I decided to do more of those. Then I'll start next next month. I'll be doing that. So that's on vanprog.com. You'll be able to find that. And also the school, JVP School of Mystical Arts. And that's that's what I'm doing right now <laughs> before the book. We'll link everything in the show notes. And for the Thank final you. trio, Here's another synchronicity because one of them was I was going to ask you, I, I'm, I'm asking you, what is the latest, greatest synchronicity that you've experienced in your life? Oh, wow. Huh. Okay. Um, I told you about, um, well, let's see. It's so weird. Um, wow. Um, well, the, the, I guess the thing I, I told you earlier, I think the story about Connie and Jack. Yeah. So, so Connie was a lady that helped raise me and she came to me for, came for a week, like saying, you need to call Jack. And I did. And he passed away. And then two days later, his son called and said, my dad just passed. <laughs> That's pretty weird. <laughs> That's really a coincidence. Or another one of, I was just talking about someone and I went down the wrong street, went into the store and there that person was. Mm. That was another great one. Yeah. So They're all around us, aren't they? They're all around us. We just pay attention. So coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And since oh. we're all God, what is your God like going to show you today? Or and, or you think about somebody, and they, of course, obviously, it's very intuitive. They they call you or they appear in your place. How many times have we heard, I just was thinking about you. So that happens. That happens every day to me. And, you know, you just have, and once more, that happens three or four times a day that happens. <laughs> I, I yeah. am going to put that on my whiteboard coincidence is god's way of remaining anonymous so good so good (laughs) the second question i have uh, for the final trio is what is the most advanced lesson that we are meant to learn on earth well i think it comes back from what i was speaking about earlier with um the, the play of these beings who said you have the energy of love all around you yet you don't use it so i think a lesson is that we need to find that divinity within ourselves first don't look at it outside of yourself you don't need churches and religion you don't need that you can get community there but stay away from dogmatic ways of being because you're fitting into their mold everybody has their own mold and it's unique so I think we come back up to learn about loving ourselves. That's really what people should be aware of. Honoring who you are, self-awareness, love. Your life will change. You start doing that. And then, and then seeing that divine light in every other person. That's the next thing that we come back here to learn is to learn to love one another. And wherever there is darkness or hate or fear, illuminate it with love and light and kindness and compassion. That's, that's it. Mm, illuminate it. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, and also with illuminate comes emanation <laughs> what does that emanation. mean emanation is emanation of light light that shines it's em, it's in, in, in emanations is coming out of emanating light so it's very funny and really i was um, when i was in my tour i had a i think i had a beer somewhere i had a beer at a pub i felt like a beer don't ask i felt like a beer oh i have another good coincidence story i'm gonna get to i'm sorry i'm gonna go backwards but the quint the thing was i was looking at this beer and i'm like how can I, I imagine spirit, but I want to be able to tell people the, the kind of light that I see or awareness. And I was looking at this beer and it was the effervescence of the bubbles, those little bubbles. Like, that's what I see. Those are like lights, like bubbling like that. That's the closest thing. 
Another really good coincidence, I got to say this one, this is a really good one. It's happened on my tour. I was, um, when you do a demonstration, which is me talking to spirit and an audience, um, you keep your mind open as a medium, you keep your mind open to whatever the spirit world wants to impress you with. So I kept my mind open during the day because my event was at night. And I, I went by a steakhouse and I thought, I want a steak. Now I'm not a big steak person, but I, I haven't had a steak in a long time. I, I want to stop and have a steak for some reason. I did. I went to this Western pet restaurant, had a steak, and I wait for a couple hours, and that was fun. And the lady was very busy, and it was fun. I had a good time. But I'm looking around this Western restaurant. There's some lovely paintings and sculptures. And for some reason, I felt compelled to go take a picture of one of these, one of these um, pictures. And I can actually, I can actually show you the, the painting that I, I took a picture of because it'll add to a little bit of the drama of this whole mm. thing here. Yeah. So it is. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. A good steak and a beer. <laughs> a good steak and a beer, I'll tell you. Okay. There we go. And it's just an amazing experience, I'll tell you. Was, this was a, a real trip. I'm just going to find the photo. I went to American Revolution. American Revolution um, cemeteries. It was wild. So in this Western restaurant, I went to and took this picture of this painting. Oh, so it's a king, right. A cowboy on a, a bull riding. Right? Bull. Yeah. Bull. yeah. So uh, during the demonstration, I said, and oh, there's a coincidence as far as spirit impressing me. But I said, there's a man here. He passed away. I was picking up who passed away at 48 years old. He was a, I, I, he was a cowboy. He rode horses and bulls. And a lady, a lady, I'm looking at the audience and I'm thinking, oh, she was just like my sister Lynn who passed over. The lady's name was Linda. Okay. So she stood up, this lady, and, and, and we're talking about different things. She goes, I said, do you know, um, I said, there's a man that died, uh, 40, whatever, 48, whatever it was, and he died of a horse, fell a horse, a young horse. And this lady screamed, yes, yes, that's my husband's uh, brother. He died that way. And I said, I never really do this. But I'm, I'm asked to come on stage. I had my phone with me. I never put my phone on stage. I said, would you take a look at this photograph? And she goes, oh, my gosh. She starts screaming. That's the photo, the painting. We put on his gravestone. No way. Wow. Yeah. That's bad. You want to call that a coincidence or impression, but that's that just that's pretty amazing. God, <laughs> God remaining anonymous there. Yeah, that's right. You know, the intelligence of the world, of those worlds, the intelligence is so beyond the humans. And they create things and make things happen that we just don't understand. But you know, they're always around us too. We don't see them, but they're always Pulling strings like marionette, where the marionette puppets and the other puppet masters. I really do believe that. You got me really curious, James. What is, okay. was it like for a medium to walk into a cemetery? Oh, it was completely dead. It's completely dead. So there's no energy in the cemeteries. It's, it's, no one's there. No one's there. <laughs> Not there at all. Us humans think they're hanging out. But no, they, there's no energy there. They, they, I don't, never, ever that I've experienced. Um, I would say that if the, you, want, you want to call it earthbound spirits, I don't believe in this on earthbound spirits per se. I think mean, it's a lot less than we think it is. But I do believe there are those emotional connections that the, a soul might still have in a certain space or place based on emotional trauma. For instance, like wars, like civil war and so forth. So um, that, that, I believe that does happen. But the, the scariest places, if people say that, or where you'll find those spirits that are still locked in the fear, if you will, kind of, I don't call it, call it earth battle, but closer to the earth, if you will, are those are living in that fear vibration of the earth. And you'll find that where? Well, where it's most fearful. So most dentist offices are haunted and most airports are haunted. <laughs> uh, like the Denver airport? I've heard some stuff about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's haunted. Because they, they use they, they siphon off fear energy from people. And that's how they sustain themselves close to this vibration. Which is really interesting. And I was at the story of this, which is very interesting. I was in um, Nashville and I was at the Nashville airport. And I remember the, uh, there was this gentleman and it was a spirit. And he was walking back and forth. And I see him walking over the airport. He didn't realize I could see him. And he had like a black page boy haircut and dark black glasses and walking around with a suit. And I don't know who this guy is, but I know he's a spirit. And I'm like, I'm not going to, I just don't want him to see me. <laughs> And he's like, but I was aware of him. I get on my airplane. And there he is in the plane. I'm like, oh, shoot. So he's walking up down the aisle. 
And this lady sits next to me, and she's a beautiful, like, blonde lady, beautiful woman from Nashville, she's flying to LA. And we got through talking, and she was really, really lovely. And I kept on seeing the man go up the aisle, and then a couple times just standing up to the front looking at him, so I'm like, oh, geez. And I spoke to this lady, and it was Roy Orbison's wife. <laughs> and the oh. man was Roy Orbison, it was a very famous rock and roll singer who had passed. And that was his wife I was talking to. Isn't that interesting? Oh, <laughs> so that was the man you were seeing. Yes. Oh. Now, was he, uh, if, is he earthbound? I don't think so, but he was so close to the earth because he wanted to get to her. He wanted to know that, you know. And I said to her at one point, I think she mentioned her husband, Roy Orbison. She said, well, you know, he's always around you. That's all I said. I didn't mention who I was or like that. I know I get that conversation started. And I knew my job really was to say, you know, he's always around. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. James, and the final question I have for you today is what does your higher self and your soul teachers want to address for humanity right now? Um, well, I, I, I think it's to make the world a better place. And again, that starts with human rights and treating one another with love and, and finding the true nature of each other, which is love. I think that's really and you know, I, I say this I mean, you know, this saying, it's a good saying, and, and people should use it and put on your whiteboard and use it. Um, that every day on our path, we are have teachers and students who come upon our path. And our job is to recognize that who's teaching us and who we are to teach. And it's working with love. So who's teaching that, that different aspect of love? And whether that's being hurt in a relationship or something else. It's an aspect of love, all the types of love. Can you love someone without conditioning, without conditions? Can you forgive someone without conditions, knowing that that's the loving thing to do, it's the right thing to do? Uh, and also you're going to be the student learning about, you know, learning about receiving. And, um, you know, so we're student teachers every day, and it's all about love, learning how to use love. And now time more than ever on this earth vibration is to use love, utilize love every single day. It's, it's more important now than ever because of the way the world is right now. Mm. My brother, James Van Hogg, <laughs> I needed this conversation more than you know, and I know it okay. is going to be medicine for a lot of people. And it's always a pleasure to see you, to talk to you. Thank you, Emilio. I can't Thank wait to do much. this again. Love, lovely, love to see you. Thank you very much.